ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶದಯಾಪಾತ್ರಂ ಧೀಭಕ್ತಿಯಾದಿ ಗುಣಾರ್ಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣಂ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯ ಜಾತರ ಮುನಿಂ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥಯಾಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮಾಂ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯ ದೈಕ ಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯಾ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶಾಪಾತ್ರೀಭಕ್ತಿಯಾಣಾರ್ಣವೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯಜಾತರ ಮುನಿ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಮ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯ ಮೇನೆ ಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯಕಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ವಿತ್ ದಿ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೋಸಿಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ನೈನ್ ಸೂತ್ರ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸೂತ್ರ ಆತ್ಮಪಹಾರವೇ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ಎಂಜಿರ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ಮಾಂ ಬೋಧು ಇಲ್ಲಯಾಯ್ ಬಿಡು ಎಂದು ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ನೈನ್ ಸೂತ್ರ ಸ್ಥಾನ ಪ್ರಮಾಣತ್ತೆ ಉಕಾರಂ ಅವಧಾರಣಾರ್ಥಿರ್ಕಶೇಷಂ ಅನ್ನೇಯಂಗಿರದೆ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸೂತ್ರ ಇಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನರ್ ಶೇಷತ್ವ ಇಲ್ಲದ ಬೋಧು ಆತ್ಮಪಹಾರ ರೂಪಮಾನ ಸ್ವಾತಂತ್ರ್ಯ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ನಡಕಯಾನೆ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಅಳಿಂದ ವಿಡುಂ ಎನ್ನ ಮತ್ತೈ ದರ್ಶಿಪ್ಪಿಕ್ಕಿದಾರ್ ಮೇಲ್ ಇರಂಡ್ ವಾಕ್ಯತ್ತಾಲೇ ಆತ್ಮಪಹಾರಮಾವದೇ ಎನ್ನ ತೊಡಂಗಿ ಅದಾವದೇ ಯೋ ಅನ್ಯಥಾ ಸಂತಮಾತ್ಮಾನ ಅನ್ಯಥಾ ನ ಪ್ರತಿಪದ್ಯ ಅನ್ಯಥಾ ಪ್ರತಿಪದ್ಯತೆ ಕಿಂತೇನ ನ ಕೃತ ಪಾಪಂ ಚೋರೇಣಾತ್ಮಪಹಾರಿಣ ಎಂದ್ರಿ ಸರ್ವ ಪಾಪಮೂಲಮಾಹಚ್ಚನ್ನ ಆತ್ಮಪಹಾರಮಾವದೆ ತನ್ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ಎಂಜಿರ ಪ್ರತಿಪತ್ತಿ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ಮಾಮಳವಿಲ್ ಅಸನ್ಮೇವಾ ಎಂಜಿರ ಪಡಿಯೇ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಇಲ್ಲಯಾಯ್ ಬಿಡು ಎಂಗೈ ಆಹೆಯ ಶೇಷತ್ವವಿಲ್ಲಾದ ಪೋದು ಸ್ವರೂಪವಿಲ್ಲೈ ಎನ್ನ ತಟ್ಟಿಲ್ಲೈ ಎನ್ನ ಕರುತ್ತೆ ಆಹ ಪ್ರಕೃತ್ಯರ್ಥಮಾನ ಈಶ್ವರನುಡೆಯ ಕಾರಣತ್ವಂ ತಾತ್ವರ್ಥಮಾನ ರಕ್ಷಕತ್ವಂ ಅರ್ಥಬಲಾಲ್ವ ಪದತ್ತಾಲ್ವಂದ ಶ್ರೀಯ ಪತಿತ್ವಂ ಪ್ರತ್ಯೇ ಸಿದ್ಧಮಾನ ಚೇತನ ಶೇಷತ್ವ ಪ್ರತಿ ಸಂಬಂಧಿಯಾನ ಶೇಷಿತ್ವಮಾಯಿರ ಅಕಾರಾರ್ಥತ್ತೈ ಅರುಣಿಚ್ಚೈದಾರಾಯಿತ್ so very beautifully so i manavala mamri summarizes the meaning of the sutra which says sheshatvam illada podu swarupam illai and also he says ಆತ್ಮಪಹಾರಮಾವಧಿ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ಎಂಗಿರಂಗಿ ಸ್ವತಂತ್ರ ಮಾಂ ಪೋದು ಇಲ್ಲೆಯ ಇದು ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವೇದಾಸ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಸೇಸ್ ಅಸನ್ನೇವ ಸಭವತಿ ಅಸದ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮೇತಿ ವೇದ ಚೇತಿ ಅಸ್ತಿ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮೇತಿ ಚೇದ್ವೇದ ಸಂತಮೇನ ತಥೋ ವಿಧು so what is the meaning of these two sentences asanneva sabhavati asad brahmeti venache so here for those who know sanskrit to a certain extent asad brahma iti vedache has to be slightly modified brahma sad iti avedache is how it has to be interpreted that is how the 
commentators comment upon this beautiful statement. What does it say? Brahma sat iti aveda chet. If a person does not understand. So understanding here is actually realization. If a person is unable to realize the existence of the Supreme Brahman, that is Lord Narayana calling us. Saha asan eva bhavati. He is as good as non-existent. That means his existence is meaningless. So unless a person realizes the existence of the Supreme Brahman, that is Lord Narayana, his existence is meaningless. I will give a small example to illustrate what it means. Suppose there is a husband who has married a lady, a person who has married a lady, he is called as a husband. But if he does not fulfill any of his duties, so he has to take care of his if he has to provide her with food and shelter, etc. Of course, I am talking in the context of the earlier days of the Indian society. When the ladies were not allowed to go out of the house and earn, and earn some money for their livelihood, etc. So, or even if you take the role of a son, what is the role of a son? He has to take care of his parents when they become old. Suppose there is a son who does not fulfill any of his responsibilities, a son should fulfill. Then what, <clears throat> what do people say? There is no difference between his being alive and being dead. That is what he says. That is what is meant in this context. Saha asan eva bhavati. That person is as good as non-existent. Because Brahma Sati Iti Because the main objective of the human life, <laughs> though none of us, <coughs> none of us, like me, I can say, I cannot, I am not competent to talk about others. Though I have read it, I have studied so much and heard so much from my own gurus, has the realization dawned upon me that the main objective is of life is to achieve the Realization of God. Has this realization dawned upon me? Actually, it has not dawned upon me. So unless a person realizes that his the very what they call in chaste English as summum bonum of life, he is to realize the Supreme Brahman. If he doesn't do that, then he is as good as God. His existence is meaningless. So here also, Swami Manavad Mahavani explains it in the same manner. Swatantramam poru indayayudu. If a person thinks that he is independent, he is not dependent on the Supreme Lord, he is not subservient to the Supreme Lord, then his existence is meaningless or he is as good as non-existent. And a beautiful verse is quoted here. <clears throat> Yo anyatha santam atmanam anyatha pratipadyate. The actual nature of the Atman, Jiva Atman, is subservience to the Supreme Lord. So, if a person does not realize that this Jiva Atma, individual soul, is subservient to the Paramatma of the Supreme Lord, or <clears throat> otherwise also, then what happens? If he thinks otherwise means if he thinks that he is independent, he is not subservient to anybody. As is mentioned, Ishvaro Ham Aham Bhogi, Siddho Ham Balavan Sukhi. I am the Lord. I enjoy everything, everything is there for my enjoyment. I have a great following. Who is equal to me? These are all the qualities of people with Asuri Sampad. That is what Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. 
<coughs> therefore atma paharam avade swatantram indira nilai so that is the taking away our abduction of the atma or actually taking away of the atma that means losing himself if a person feels or thinks that he is independent and not subservient to the lord then he has lost himself he has no way of being redeemed at any at any stage so these are two extremes if a person does not know he is subservient that is one thing he may gradually realize but if he insists that he is never subservient or if he insists that he is totally independent then it means that he has lost himself there is no way that he can be redeemed at any stage until he realizes that he is not he is subservient to the supreme lord and not independent so that is why he says sheshatvam illad apodu illaya i vidum when he does not realize his subservience to the supreme lord he is as good as non existent so this is the <coughs> purport of this sutra and <coughs> he also further says ahayal sheshatvam illada polu swarupam illai ennattillai ennu karuthu and then swami manohar bani beautifully summarizes four important points which are <coughs> mentioned by the word a so this is one single syllable a has the following meanings what is what are they ಪ್ರಕೃತ್ಯರ್ಥಮಾನೀಶ್ವರನುಡೆಯಕಾರಣತ್ವಮುಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ವೀವ್ ಟೂ ಕಂಪೋನೆ
So when you say Supreme Lord is Rakshaka or the protector, then automatically it implies that he is the <coughs> Lord of Goddess Shri or Shri Pati, the husband of Shri Pati, the consort of Shri Pati. And then Pratya Siddhama Na Chetana Sheshatva Pratisambandhiya Na Sheshatva Mahira Akara Arthattai Arudicchaida Raithi Pratya Siddhama Na Chetana Sheshatva Then you have the suffix which actually conveys the meaning that the Chetana is the Shesha of the Samsarvim. So when you say Dasharathasya Putraha Rama, Rama is the son of Dasharatha. What does this actually imply? It implies that Dasharatha is the father of Rama. So once you say Rama is the son of Dasharatha, you need not once again say Dasharatha is the father of Rama. Once you say Rama is the son of Dasharatha, you need not say Dasharatha is the father of Rama. So once you say the Chetana is the subservient person, Chetana Sheshatva, that is the individual soul is subservient, it automatically suffices to say that the Lord is Sheshi. So in, like you have two mutually connected words, father, son, husband, wife, then brother, sister or sister, brother in that case, or <clears throat> several other such words. In Sanskrit, you have a huge repository of such words. For example, substrate and substratum, these two words are used extensively in philosophical parlance, not ordinary English, because they are technical terms. So, adhara and adheya, for example, which is used in Sanskrit. So, adhara is the location or the locus and adheya a very rare word which denotes the object that exists in the location for example now i am having this phone in front of me and the table in front of me so the phone is on the table when i say the phone is on the table the table is the adhara or the locus on which or in which the phone is situated so then, what is the word to denote the phone which is located on the table or in the table? In Sanskrit, you have a word for it to denote that thing which is known as Adheya. The location is called as Adhara Aradhikarana. Whereas the object that exists in the location is known as Adheya. I don't think there is an equal word in English to, devote, to denote the word denote the exact meaning of what is conveyed by the word Adhya. So these are called Pratisambandhi Shabdas. So they are <coughs> mutually dependent Shabdas or words having mutually dependent meanings. For example, you have she, in this context Shesha and Sheshi. Shesha means the object that is object or entity or person that is subservient. So the person to whom this entity is subservient is known as Sheshi. <clears throat> that is why I mentioned in an earlier class there are several types of relationships between the Supreme Lord and the individual soul. It says Swamitva, Atmatva, Sheshatva, Pumstva Adhyaha, Swamino Gunaha. Swamitva, Aswamitvam, Atmatvam, Sheshitvam, Pumstvam. Svebhyaha, Dasatva, Dehatva, Vashitva, Stritva, Daitva. So, <coughs> respectively, four mutually dependent words are if he is the Swami, we are the Dasas. So, the Master-servant relationship. So if there has to be a servant, there has to be a master. Otherwise, he will not be called as a servant. So if a master is there, then has to be a servant. Otherwise, he will not be called as a master. So before 
Rama married Sita. Can he be called as a husband? No, because there is nobody to show that he is, there is no wife. So how can he be a husband? He is a bachelor. Or before Sita Rama married Rama, did she have a husband? No, because she is a spinster. So unless there is another object that actually fulfills the criteria of the relationship, these two things cannot come into existence. So Swamitva, <coughs> Swamitva Pumtashehita Pumstva, Swamitva Dasatva, Swami Dasabhava, Swami Prithyabhava, Swami and Prithya are two mutually dependent words. Atmatvam Dehatvam Dehatma Swarupam or Sharira Shariri Bhava, as Ramanda Acharya used to put it. So this is the body and the Atma within this body is known as the Shariri or Atma. Similarly, when you go to the stage of the Jivatma and Paramatma, the Jivatma is in the form of the, is in the place of the body. Whereas Paramatma is in the form of the soul that exists within the body. Swamitva, Atmatva, Sheshatva, Sheshatva and Sheshitva. And Pumstva and Stritva. <coughs> so in husband-wife relationship, the wife is three, whereas the husband is Puman, is a male, wife is female. Of course, in those days, they did not <laughs> think about gay people, etc. So, <clears throat> just this a passing remark, don't mistake me. So, these are Pratisamanti Shabdas, as we see that. And to understand these texts, we have to know properly these technical terms. So that is why Manavala Mami Swami Manavala Mami says Pratyesiddhamana chetana sheshatva pratisammandhyana sheshitva mahira akara arthattai arudit chayda raiti So all these four meanings are obtained by the single word come uh, syllable of akara so how this meaning has been obtained? Can anyone think of four meanings for a single syllable? That is the greatness of Sanskrit language and also how <coughs> the interpretations ex exist in our ancient Shastras. Because I have not come across any word or syllable for that matter which can actually convey four meanings at the same time. That too in a very systematic and uh, precise manner. So, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that other languages are inferior. It means that Sanskrit language is so rich and also so systematic. So, then we come to the next sutra. Anantaram madhyamaksharamana ukaratthik arthattai arthamarudicchai varaha upakramikirar sthana pramanattale ukaram avadharanartham Indri Adavadi Tadeta Deva Bhutam Tadubhavyama Idam Indram Tadeva Gnistad Vayustad Suryas Tadu Chandrama Aham Indramitya Di Hari Dev Eva Karastara Tile Ukarte Payokita Kandeale Stana Pramanatale Ukaram Avadharanati Atamaha <coughs> so, first the sutra is Sthana Pramanattale Ukaram Avadharanartham, which means <coughs> a particular word, when it is used in a particular context, has a particular meaning. So, depending upon the context of the word in which, in the context in which it is used, the word, <coughs> the meaning of the word is determined. So I will give an example in Sanskrit, <coughs> because I cannot recall an example immediately, an English example immediately. So in Sanskrit, there is a word called Saindhava. Saindhava means there are two meanings. One meaning is 
horse and another meaning is salt so sindava lavana means a particular type of salt which was extensively used in india and even now ayurvedic doctors prescribe this type of salt for particular medical conditions not the regular salt that is obtained by from obtained from the sea which is iodized and all those things these days that is iodine is added sometimes some people say it should be added some people say no etc it is not pertinent to the present context so sindava lavana means sindava itself means a particular type of rock salt we can say not the salt that is obtained obtained by the sea <clears throat> so suppose a person says sindava mamaya bring the sindava so what should the person who is listening to do should he bring a horse or should he bring a sword should he bring sword so it, the meaning of the word sindava has to be interpreted based on the context suppose the person is leaving for a war or he is leaving on some expedition then when the person says sindava maniya then his servant should go and get the horse suppose <clears throat> the person a person is having lunch or dinner and he finds that there is a little bit of less salt in a particular dish so many a times people <clears throat> add some more salt that is why it is actually even today in, in the modern context when people eat on dining tables salt pepper etc are kept readily for use because some people want to add more salt so there is this habit of people adding salt to some dishes their salt is less or they want more more salt in the dish so when a person who is having lunch or dinner says sindava <clears throat> maniya then definitely the word sindava refers to salt only so how to determine the meaning what is the meaning of the word sindava it is based on the context so if he is going if the person who says sindava maniya is going on an expedition then the horse has to be brought from the stable or if a person is having lunch and he says sindava maniya then he has to bring salt from the kitchen and give it to him so this is what is known as sthana pramanatale that means in one way I, the example i given is based on the context here based on the context not only based on the context and it's also based on the particular position of the word in the sentence i will give one example from sanskrit so there is a let us assume that there is a sentence ramaha lakshmanasya grihe phalam khadati this is one sentence ramah lakshmanasya grihe phalam khadati what does this mean rama eats a fruit sitting in lakshmana's house suppose i change the position of the word lakshmanasya and say ramah grihe lakshmanasya phalam khadati then the meaning totally changes rama sitting in his house eats the fruits of lakshmana that means fruits brought by lakshmana so <clears throat> the meaning of the word lakshmana should be determined based on the po- on its position in the sentence so there is a highly technical aspect of sanskrit language but since we are dealing with sanskrit a sanskrit mantra which has <clears throat> several concepts belonging to several of the shastras like mimamsa shastra this concept belongs to what is known as purva mimamsa shastra which deals with the interpretation of vedic classics so here you have akara which means the supreme lord narayana on the one hand 
and on the other hand you have makara which means the jivatma and in the middle you have ukara a u and ma idu a ennum u ennum ma ennum moondru thiruvaksharam that is what was mentioned earlier so the word om which is the first alphabet or first syllable and also the first word of the three words of the mantra om namo narayana in the <coughs> word om you have three components namely akara ukara and makara akara has conveyed or conveys four meanings which we just noted earlier today then we have already said makara actually makaram jeeva vaathi makaram niravatam davada aksharamai jnana vaathi umai rukum so makara denotes the individual solar jivatma and this u is situated between a and ma so it actually is used in an assertive sense sthana pramanatale ukaram avadharanartham what is the meaning of the word avadharana avadharana means assertion <clears throat> so the word ukara is used in the sense of assertion because of its being situated between a and ma that is what is known as sthana pramana by means of its existing between akara and makara the ukara denotes what is known as assertion how do we know this is there any precedent to interpret ukara in this manner because u does not have any particular meaning in sanskrit we call this as stobhaksharas so for example in we say oh my god what does oh my god mean or at least here you have three mean three words in english you say gosh what's happened what does the word gosh mean in kannada and other we say ayyo <laughs> so in sanskrit we say hanta hanta harshe anukampayam etc say ayyo that means either when you are very excited or when you have to express compassion so you say gosh you say oh my god in sanskrit we say ayyo rama what is it something like that or uh, in english in the novels they say jesus christ what has happened something like that <laughs> that doesn't mean he is actually remembering jesus christ he it's only an expression of excitement or compassion or something like that. so these words like gosh etc do not have any particular meaning as exposed by the <clears throat> so what happens sthana pramanatale you have to interpret the meaning of these alphabets come words alphabet come word right it's based on the context so here he gives two examples tadeva bhutam tadubhavya ma idam tadeva agnistad vayustad suryas tadu chandrama aha so in these two passages the word u tadeva bhutam tat u tat u bhavyama idam artha deva agnistad vayustad suryas tat u chandrama aha and you have several such passages so i manavana mamuni has quoted two here on the other hand we have sa ushreya bhavati jayamana tandhira sah kavaya unnayanti sah u shreyane bhavati jayamana this passage mentions about the greatness of the incarnation of the supreme power sah shreyane eva bhavati so the word u is used in the sense of eva which means verily which roughly means verily 
or surely, which means avadharana, definitely, without any doubt. So several shades of meanings can come or can be obtained from the word eva. So he says, in mamitya dhyadile, eva karasthanatile, Mukarate prayogi kekarn gayale, stana pramadatale, Mukaram avadharana, avadharanate, atama haudeta irkum in day. So, therefore, since the Ukara is situated between Akara and Makara, and we have several instances where Ukara has been used in the sense of Eva in a highly assertive sense. Here also, Ukavam avadharanatti arthamaha udaitta irukku. So, Ukara is assertive, in used in an assertive sense. So, what is this assertion? That is, once again, explained in a highly technical manner by Swami Manavadavanda Mahamuni. He says, Ittal pirar kishesha manne imgiradi <clears throat> so when you say the individual soul is subservient only to the Supreme Lord Narayana, that is what is assertion. So in this context it means only. So the meaning of the word Om is that the individual soul is subservient only to the Supreme Lord Narayana. So then what is the meaning of the assertion? If you explain it in other words, when you say he is subservient only to the Supreme Lord Narayana, it means he is not at all subservient to anybody else other than Lord Narayana. That is what is mentioned. Ittal pirar kishesham anni. He is not subservient to anybody else other than Narayana. How do you get this meaning? So in Sanskrit you have a very very <coughs> important uh, concept. I will just, uh, I have prepared a slide. I will just try to show it to you. So luckily I have found the slide which is relevant to this context. I will share it now. Are you able to see this slide? Yes, Swami. Yes. So here we have three meanings of Evakara according to the Shastras. <clears throat> so those who, are, who have little bit knowledge of Sanskrit can actually <clears throat> understand this very easily. So considering the sentence Parthaha Eva Dhanurdharaha Partha means Arjuna. Arjuna alone is the person who is sporting the bow. So here Partha is the Visheshya or the noun that is qualified by the adjective Dhanurdhara. Dhanurdhara means a person who is wearing or having a bow with him. <coughs> so that means this is known as Visheshya Sangata Evakara. It means the evakara is associated with the visheshya or the noun that is being qualified by the adjective. So this is known as anya yoga vyavachyeva. Here the word eva is associated with the noun or visheshya that is qualified by the adjective visheshana and therefore it conveys the meaning that others do not possess the same attribute denoted by the adjective. So, partha anyas minne dhanurdharatva yoga vyavachidyade. That is how we say. That means, when you say partha eva dhanurdharaha, it means that others do not have the quality of dhanurdharatva, meaning they don't actually, <coughs> they are not sporting about, example, Bhima or Nakula or Sahadeva or Yudhishthira. The second example is Shankaha Panduraha Yeva. 
So here, Shankha is the noun and Pandura is the adjective and Eva is found after the word Pandura, which is the adjective. This is known as Visheshana Sankata Eva Kamra. That means, here you see, here the word Eva is associated with the adjective Visheshana that is qualifying the noun. Therefore, it conveys the meaning that the object conveyed by the noun, noun can possess only that attribute denoted by the adjective and not any similar attribute. So when the Shankha is white only, it means Shankha cannot be red or black or any other, of any other color. And finally, you have what is known as Kriya Sankata Yavakara, which says Atyanta Yoga Vyavachya, which means the word Eva is found after the noun, which says me, which the example is Neelam Sarojam Bhavat Eva. So here the word Eva is associated with the word verb, Kriya. Therefore, it conveys the meaning that the object conveyed by the noun can possess only that attribute denoted by the adjective and never any other similar attribute. So the Saroja or the water lily, which you have seen here, that is that actually um, uh, becomes a, what is known as Vikasa. It attains Vikasa, I am not able to immediately because blooms, blooms when the rays of the moon come. For example, if it's a lotus, lotus blooms due to the rays of the sun. Whereas the water lily, which is known as Saroja in this context, blooms when the moon rises. That can be of the blue color only and not in the color. So it is known as Atyanta Ayoga Vyavachena. So why is it relevant in this context? So I will give this example and then come to the present example. <clears throat> so here you see in the Brahma Sutra there are four padas. That is the first pada is Ayoga Vyavacheda pada. That means these padas negate the notion that Brahman is not the cause of the universe. That is Brahma Jagat Karana Meva. <clears throat> then the subsequent three padas convey the concept of Anya Yoga Vyavacheda, which means these padas negate the notion that some entity other than the Brahman is the cause of the universe. So Brahmaiva Jagat Karana, Brahman alone is the cause of the universe. <clears throat> so this is the use of Anya Yoga Vyavacheda and Ayoga Vyavacheda. In the present context, Pilladokacharya, Swami Pilladokacharya. So it says both of them are valid when we consider the meaning of Ukara. It says the Jiva Atma is, alone, is subservient to the Supreme Lord alone. And Jiva Atma alone can be subservient to the Supreme Lord. <coughs> to the maximum possible extent. So that's what he says. The commentary. Avadharanatukum ayoga vivache the madan, and yoga vivache the madan. So there are two meanings for the word avadharana, that is yeva, which is translated as only. Ahaya liv avadharanatal, chodu hirade, ye denna ruvite hira. In the Adavadi, Avadhar and Avajakamana, Vukaratal, Kil, Ishwara Sheshama, Hachuna, Yvatma was two, and Yerkeshama, in the middle of the day, should be here in day. So this Chetana, the Jivatma, is subservient to the Supreme Lord alone and not to anybody else. That is what mainly it is a Niyoga Vyavacheda. And Ayoga Vivacheda also can be said in the sense Sheshatva definitely exists in the Atma. There cannot be any other place where Sheshatva exists as it exists in the Atma, in the Jiva. Of course, you have Achetana also, it is subservient. But the way Chetana is subservient to the Atma is totally different from the way Achetana is subservient to the Atma. 
because there is a huge difference between chetana and achetana because chetanas have a small iota of swatantra that is mentioned in the uh, brahma sutras where it says karta shastra thavatva does kartritva doership or agency exist <coughs> to the in the jivatma or not when the question is raised of course we say is totally subservient but in that subservience also there is some swatantriya that is given by the supreme lord himself to the jivatma to that extent, extent swatantriya is there otherwise if you were to be totally 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 subservient which we accept but that subservience includes a small iota of swatantriya that is given to him that's why i am mentioning this this is specially mentioned in the uh, shri bhashyam if you are totally subservient and he has no swatantriya at all then what is the meaning of the vidhini shastra shastras why were the do's and don'ts specifically laid down for the jivatma to choose from so the swatantriya is there in the sense that it is part of the subservience so suppose there is a higher officer everything that he says has to be obeyed by the subordinate but once the officer may say now i am giving you the power to take a decision in this regard you have to independently take a decision without consulting me in in a particular context then is it subservience or is it swatantriya given to the subordinate it means that that swatantriya is also the result of subordination only <laughs> so it's a very 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 subtle issue which you, which you have to understand in this context so even the swatantriya given to the sabha jeevatma is a part of the sheshatva only because that swatantriya is given by the supreme lord it is not his himself <clears throat> so here what happens <clears throat> the supreme lord is the shesha he is alone the he is the sheshi and he alone is the sheshi the jeevatma can never be the sheshi that is what is mentioned here and sheshatva alone exists in the jeevatma sheshitva cannot exist in the jeevatma so this is what is mentioned and here also he says periya viratya rakshesamanne shesham yengira dinnum shuddu varhal adinum anya sheshatvam kaihaye pradhanam then the question is raised is he not subservient to god is mahalakshmi you are telling only to the supreme lord then Then, then does he not be subservient to God as Lakshmi? That question is answered in the next sutra, which we will deal with in the next class. So today has been a highly technical session. I hope uh, all of you have been able to understand what I have mentioned. Still, if you have any further doubts, you may kindly ask, and I will be. I will try to clarify them. But one thing is. one thing we have to realize is these are all as i have been mentioned mentioning our sampradaya shivaishnava sampradaya is based on the vishishta advaita philosophy which has very 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 strong theoretical foundations all these are backed up by strong logical and theoretical foundations which can never be shaken that is why it has survived for such a long time though of course today there are very 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 number of few number of persons studying it one main thing one lacuna in many people who give discourses on these topics today is 90% of the sampradaya scholars have not studied sanskrit and also they have not studied the shastras so these aspects they will just uh, 
Passover actually, and not go into the details, which will actually hinder the correct and exact understanding. This is not to belittle any persons who give discourses, but actually what has happened is the concepts of the Shastras are embedded in Sampradaya Granthas also. That is why the theoretical foundations are so strong and these can be explained only by persons who have also studied the Shastras in a formal and in the Gurukula system under a qualified Acharya. Then only justice can be done to while justice can be done while explaining these things. So that aspect has to be kept in mind because any other people every day I get mails and uh, alerts that this person is taking Mumukshupani, that person. Of course, we respect each and every person for their value and also scholarship. But today, the scholars uh, who come from Tamil Nadu lack the knowledge of Sanskrit and Shastras due to the, not due to their own ignorance or due to their own incompetence, they are quite competent. But due to the policy of the Tamil government, they have been totally eliminated from even knowing the basic Sanskrit words, due to which I regularly listen to several discourses and all the Sanskrit words are pronounced in a very bad manner most of the times. There might be exceptions, which actually is a great disservice to the Sampradaya because always our Sampradaya is Ubhaya Vedanta, which consists of Sanskrita Vedanta and Dravida Vedanta. So knowledge of both of these is very much essential. So that lacuna has to be overcome by those people who are not able to, who are not, uh, able, who do not possess that knowledge of Sanskrit and also the Shastras. So any questions? <clears throat> so I think in the chat, Swami, uh, Gurminachari was asking that you were saying that Jiva is subservient to the Lord alone, uh, as shown by the word Eva. Um, but, uh, He's asking about the jiva is also the jivatman is also uh, subservient to the acharya and or other bhagavatas, other other vaishnavas. So yes, I think is. this is going to be covered in the next sutras, right? So in the the first stage, yes, that is correct. So you have several stages in the. Uh, so, for example, when you study in the fifth standard or the uh, sixth standard when you are young, you are taught this is what is the final thing. But as you go deep, you are taught, no, this is what you have to learn more, this is what you have to learn more, this is what you have to learn more. So, when you progress as a, as a person, as a Sri Vaishnava or as a Sri Vaishnava devotee, what happens? you transcend several stages and then become complete. So when you say Bhagavad Cheshatva, now we are talking about Bhagavad Cheshatva. So after a particular stage, you become Shesha to Bhagavata. So we call it as Bhagavata Shesha as he has rightly pointed out about the Acharya or other Bhagavatas. So what does Bhagavata mean? What does the word Bhagavata mean? Bhagavataha ayam Bhagavataha. A person who is totally subservient to the Supreme Lord. So, if you cannot become totally subservient to the Supreme Lord, you become subservient to a person who is totally subservient to the Supreme Lord. So, it is one way if you are unable to do that, you do this. Or when you see that a person is a great, great, great devotee of the Lord, you automatically become subservient to him. Because my Acharya used to say, and this is well exposed in the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, when a person, a honest and sincere devotee, he has to be an honest and sincere devotee, realizes that another devotee is more evolved than him automatically he will become his servant. So that is why we say Bhagavata Sheshatva. Bhagavata Sheshatva means what? Shesha to a person who is subservient to Bhagavan. So there also the 
Bhagavad Samantha is not left out. So in the Bhagavad, in the beginning, you are Shesha to Supreme Lord alone. But as you progress, you are Shesha to not only the Supreme Lord, you are Shesha to a person who is subservient to the Supreme Lord also. There also the Supreme Lord's relationship is very, very, very important. So this is the first stage. But as you progress, when you suppose you realize that one more person is more nearer to the Supreme Lord. That is, that is the very sum and substance of our Sampradaya. So that is why we have Antimopaya Nishta as I explained in the previous class. So ultimately you become subservient to his devotees, which will lead you faster, not only to his devotees, that is why Namadvar says, Sapta Parvadasya and even Kulashekar Advar says in his Mukunda Bala, he says, Tvadhritya Vritya Paricharaka Vritya 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 Sya Vritya Himam Svara Tokanatha. So the Lord's servant, his 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 servant. And then I am that servant of that servant who is the seventh servant of you. So you become so humble. Your humility is so great that even the seventh stage servant of the Supreme Lord become, you become subservient to him. That is because they are Bhagavatas. It means they belong to the Supreme Lord. So Acharya is Bhagavata Shreshta who leads you to the Supreme Lord. So you are subservient to him. Because as I mentioned in the previous class, the Lord likes people who are subservient to his devotees more than those who are subservient to he himself. That is the beauty of Shiva Ishtra Sampradaya which has realized this aspect. So many a times we see, suppose a person loves his wife very much and there is a servant who is more subservient to his wife than he himself. He likes him more than the servant who is subservient to himself. Because that servant who is subservient to his wife is fulfilling all his her desires. And that wife is closest to him. He loves her so much. And we see, suppose there is a father and there is a servant who is rendering service to his son. That servant becomes very close to the father because he is serving his son who is very close to him. So a person automatically loves another person who is serving his loved one more than a person who is serving he himself. This is quite natural. So these intrinsic values have been realized and exposed to the Shiva Ishtra which makes it more, more and more and more evolved because it is based on principles of nature which we see are principles that are prevalent in nature. So I hope you have received the answer to your question. So he is, when you say subservient to Bhagavata, there itself lies the answer. Have you, are you satisfied with the answer? Are you convinced? Perfect answer, Swami. Thank you so much. That's a really, really wonderful answer. Uh, any other question? Uh, Adiyan Dasan Namaskaram. Uh, this is Ram Namaskaram. Srinivas. Yes, I just have one question, uh, Swami. Uh, Swami, uh, you mentioned that uh, as opposed to Achetana, it is only Chetana that can actually be subservient to the Lord. Yes. But now, uh, now if we consider Jivatma to be the Chetana, is the body of the Jivatma not Achetana? Because whatever the body might be, body is like the shell, which is the outer part of the soul. Is yes. that not Achetana? Now this Achetana can be either human, it can be animal, it can be vegetation, it can be any inanimate object. Yes. So how is it that this Achetana, that is the outer shell, which protects the Chetana, which is the inner soul, how does it actually either, you know, permit or, you know, uh, probably prevent this Chetana to actually become subservient to the Lord, number one. Number two, 
what happens when uh, uh, the chetana that is the soul goes out of the achetana which is the outermost body that is the shell then what is the scope of this particular chetana how is it then able to be subservient to the lord so there are the very 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 good question very profound question also <clears throat> so why i mentioned the achetana the subservience of achetana is different from the subservience of chetana the achetana has no swatantriya at all whatsoever it is purely commanded by the supreme lord himself whereas chetana has one a small iota of swatantriya where he can actually say i am he can say i am independent and actually lose his existence so he is actually given independence in the sense that either he can redeem himself or he can lose himself or he can perish but the achetana does not have that problem it is totally subservient always because it has no independence at all whatsoever so that is the difference between the subservience of achetana and subservience of chetana because suppose there is a stone that is lying in front of your house you throw it somewhere it will not say why have you thrown me you keep it there itself it will not say why you have kept it here kept me here whereas the chetana can ask such a question he can say i he can of course he may not be we uh, at this stage when we are in the stage of bondage he may not be able to question why god is doing something like that because we have not realized but once that realization comes you can question for example namalvar question why have you kept me here though you have given me your divine vision still why have you kept me with this body in this material world so even that is he himself says that oh you know, still i think i have some swatantriya that is why i am questioning you still i have a lot more to realize so that is the basic difference between the jivatma sheshatva subservience and the <coughs> subservience of the achetana or insentient power that is the answer to the first question second question is when the jivatma leaves the body that is the outer shell it is purely whether <laughs> a person feels he is swatantra or not whether a person realizes his subservience or not he is purely controlled by the supreme lord because now assuming that i have come into this body after <clears throat> being in some loka i should have had some previous all of us not only me all of us should have had some previous births so we have left this uh, left the body earlier body then we have traveled to some place whether it is swarga or naraka or some other world or some state some dormant state then once again through the father's uh, <clears throat> body and mother's body we have entered into this body and once again we have we have to leave this body and go somewhere once again we may be born or we may attain moksha whatever it is but once the jivatma leaves the body he has no even when we are in the body that is why that is why i have been mentioned we have no swatantriya except for some small aspects where we go where we come etc because even while we are sleeping we actually breathe it's an involuntary activity heart is pumping blood it's an involuntary activity if i want to stop it i cannot stop it now or if it stops i cannot revive it it is not a, even suppose a person has a heart attack and they say they do all the push their heart and push this place and do all those things it may not revive because it's not in their hands even if the person is even if the jivatma is within the body even the bodily functions are not under his control so suppose i want to hold my breath for 20 seconds can will i be able to do it now are you be able to do it <clears throat> it will start suddenly it will jump out the breath will jump out 
That means even your breath you cannot control for more than I can. I may do it for five five seconds, maximum ten seconds. But suppose you have practiced for ten years, then you may be able to do it for thirty seconds, forty seconds. So the jiva atma is totally dependent because even his breathing is not under his control, the heart pumping is not under his control, all the bodily functions are totally not under his control. So where is his swatam? But he has an ayata of sovereignty and is given by the God himself. In the sense, suppose I have to do Ashtakshara Japa, that is in my hands to a particular extent. There, a little sovereignty is there. Or if somebody wants to afflict somebody, kill somebody, or harm somebody, they are able to do it. That means they have that small bit of sovereignty. Thank you, Swami. Thank you very much. Namaste. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, Swami, definitely. It was a very lucid and also very detailed explanation. Thank you, Swami. Namaskar. Namaskaram. <laughs> Amam Jatanam Bhoja Samashri Nashadi Maha.